back in the early 2000s, Silicon Valley promoted big data as the means to revolutionize not only marketing and business, but the scientific method itself. Theories were no longer necessary or desirable. Physics and biology were to be transformed. Yet the claimed scientific breakthroughs have not yet materialized. And instead of being neutral and, and value free, many argue that in actual fact, big data embeds the prejudices of those writing the code. So should we reject the claims for big data as marketing hype for big tech? Should we conclude theories are not only necessary, but unavoidable? Or might developments in computing power enable machines to identify patterns that are more powerful than any human theories that have ever been dreamed up by us and in turn bring us to a better picture of reality? So to answer that question, I turn to our, our speakers. First, we have Kenneth Kukier, who is a, an American journalist, writer, and author. He's most acclaimed for his contributions to The Economist magazine and his book, Big Data, A Revolution That Will Transform How We Work, Live, and Think, co-authored with Victor Meyer Schomberger. Norcha Mares is an author at the, and professor at the University of Warwick. Her work is uh, focused on science and technology and society and how they overlap with public policy and everyday life. Joanna Bryson, to my left, is Professor of Ethics and Technology at Hertie School in Berlin and is a founding member of the Center for Digital Governance. And since July 2020, Professor Bryson has been one of the nine experts nominated by Germany to the Global Partnership for Artificial Intelligence. So the question we're trying to tackle on this panel today is, uh, were the claims that big data should replace scientific theory uh, just marketing hype for big tech? And to kick us off, we're going to turn to Kenneth, who I hope can actually explain what big data is and in some way help us ask, answer that question. Absolutely. Thank you, Luke. So let's first take a... I've got three minutes. Now I've got two and a half. Let's first remember what data is, right? Data, the information is all around us. Everything is informational. The, the, the beautiful dulcet tones of a baby crying, you know, the, the, the lovely uh, um, sunlight and then the, you know, the wind that goes through. And if we wanted to quantify that so that we could reuse it and interact with it, we would datify it. We'd render it into a data format. So we took something that was informational and turned it into data and then we could maybe store it we could run analyses of it and find out that it's likely to rain under these conditions or not. So that's data. So what is big data? Well, big data was a, was a sort of a shorthand to refer to this idea that we have more data sources than ever before, but not just more in a linear sense, like I have 10 and today I've got 20, but in an exponential sense that had gone in sort of, a, in sort of a, if you will, from factors from 10 to 100 to 1,000. But if you do that again and again, suddenly when in a universe where you had 10 of something, you now have 10 billion of something. And if you have that sort of scale of difference, which you did get with transistors, for example, suddenly you can do new things with 10 billion of something, say observations of weather patterns, that you couldn't do when you only had smaller amounts of it, say 10 of it. So the term big data was the shorthand for that, but it was also a shorthand for machine learning, a, statist a technique of basically statistics, but in the family of AI that went from not really, from working a little bit, but not much in the 1950s and 60s to something that showed huge uh, promise by 2010. Uh, image recognition systems online, translation are examples. But the key thing is this, behind the, the concept of machine learning is a statistical um, or algorithmic uh, con term or concept of feature extraction. And that is to say that you don't know at the outset what is the relevant variable, but depending on the output you want to get, the system identifies what's relevant and then looks for it and then is able to identify it and learn something new about this body of data that you didn't know before. Let me give you uh, two very quick examples 
of looking at examples of retinas. If you have millions of people's retinas, not only can you identify features from it, such as whether they're a smoker or their age, but their sex, whether they're male or female. And that turns out to be incredibly important because the practitioners and the science didn't know that the retina would actually encode a person's gender. Just, there's no theory behind it. There's, there's nothing for a human being to look at the retina scan and know to look for to identify it. Yet, there's something in there that we can identify. Now, if you take that, uh, that concept just as a, as a principle that there's going to be this body of, of this quotient of information unknown to the human mind that can be identified in a large body of data through these new techniques, suddenly let's look at where in the sciences we can apply this new method, and here's where I'll end because I know time is ticking, protein folding. And lo and behold, DeepMind had a system, AlphaFold, that was able to predict the ways in which proteins would fold, which turns out to be incredibly complex and also turns out to be incredibly beneficial if you want to design new medications. So I look at a, at a session and the title that it is now are the claims of big data um, just marketing hype for big tech. And I have to pull out my hair and wonder, on what planet is is, uh, is the Institute of Art and Ideas, because big data is making huge contributions already, and we should embrace it. Thank you. Well, there we go. We're done. We can, we can leave now. Um, but maybe, maybe, Joanna, we should turn to you. So big data, uh, the big opportunity or big problem? <laughs> Both, of course, but I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to go ahead and, and talk about the first question you asked. Course, yeah. um, uh, and, I, and I won't uh, say that uh, I am going to say, aren't I, that uh, if, if you can tell sex from retinas, you might not be able to tell gender from retinas. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I don't know that. I, I haven't seen the day. There may, you may be able to tell gender, too. Uh, but where are we? Let's talk about models. And let's, so actually, Ken's done a great uh, introduction on the data and the data science. I want to do a little bit of an introduction on science. So we often get told that what science is about is you take, uh, you, have, you have two theories, and then you get some data, and you compare those theories. And then the one that, that fits the, the, the data better wins, right? <laughs> it's like a game, right? Now, in fact, uh, it's not quite that simple, because you have to define better. Sometimes a much more complicated theory will match the data better, um, but it will only match that data, and it won't be as good at predicting the future. So in machine learning, we call that overfitting. In science, we often we favor as simple of theory as possible, because we're basically trying to make an abstraction. We're trying to understand the world and predict things from the world and be able to do useful things with the world, you know, and, and like, useful things for ourselves. Now we need to do useful things for the planet, um, for ourselves. But anyway, the point is you pick a level of abstraction at which you can get things done. OK, so I have definitely heard uh, people from big tech and indeed uh, people who just take lots of money from big tech saying things like, oh, now I'm going to correct you too, sorry. <laughs> at, at the beginning, you said that, uh, you know, that programmers introduce uh, bias with their programming into, into data. It's, it's, more, it's different than that. I was one of the pe people on, that authored the paper that was in Science in 2017 showing that uh, if you train um, AI on the stuff that we all produce, our, you know, our language, the internet, things like that, you wind up with the same implicit biases that we have. It's not surprising. And the same, we, in the same paper, we showed that those implicit biases reflect our lived reality. So a lot of things that are called sexist and racist are like pointing out that actually women and people of color are living different lives than men and people of no color. I don't know what the option is there. <laughs> but anyway, that, 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 you, that these things do have consequences in your lives. And when we talk about, when we, when we try, I'm not saying that uh, implicit bias doesn't matter, but that explicitly we're negotiating for a better future. And that AI, like some of our, our backgrounds, uh, will we'll come up with responses that are based on a lot of old 1950s television shows that we don't want to reflect the current world. Okay, if that makes sense. All right, so. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.